There is a story somewhere in the Desert Fathers about an elder and one of his disciples. The disciple was struggling for a long time, had been struggling with lust. And he kept on coming to make his confession to his elder and kept on saying, my body made me do this, my body dragged me into this. It's because of my body that I've fallen again and again. And um, it happened that once one of, of his brothers, one of his monastic brothers, died. And the elder asked his disciple, the struggling one, to come and... Um, and pray with him over the dead body of their brother. And as they were looking at the dead body of their brother, the elder asked his disciple if he sees any movement, if he sees any passion, any lust in the dead body of their brother. And of course the disciple said, no, of course, this is a dead body, this is a dead corpse. There can be no passion, there can be no lust in a dead corpse. And um, the elder said, the same is true of you, my son. Because only when your free will, only when your thoughts, only when your emotion unite themselves to your body, then your body falls into passions such as lust and gluttony and laziness and all the other ones. I remember how important this story was for me when I read it the first time. I remember what, uh, I think you call these things game changers, this story has been. For me to understand that without the contribution, without the push of my thoughts, of the creations of my mind, without the push of my emotions, the creations of my heart, which are both possible only when my free will agrees to give them life, to give life either to my thoughts or to my emotions. Without these pushes from the mind or the heart, then my body is motionless and my body is nothing but, but flesh in and of itself, unable to do anything, either good or bad. There are moments in our lives, there are periods in our lives, uh, when we grow in our teenage years and um, for some earlier or later, for a few years, when our bodies, because of their changes and all the hormones that um, are raging through, through them, then the body itself falls into passion because of its own needs, its own battle, its own struggles. But try to think of yourself. Try to think of yourself and the last time you've fallen into lust of any kind. Each of us, you know, have our own ways of falling into all these sins, even people in monasteries, because... Someone like St. Basil the Great claimed, I have not known a woman, and yet I cannot call myself a virgin. Because, like any other human being, he had a mind, he had a thought that could betray him. So try to think of yourself and your particular way of falling into lust, and ask yourself, when this happens, does it happen because my body is simply uncontrollably um, taken over, possessed by passion? Does it happen because your body is in such a state of physical excitement that you simply can no longer control it? Or does it happen because a thought came and you opened yourself to that thought and then that thought became multiplied in your mind and then you found sweetness in that thought and you allowed that sweetness to enter you and you've taken pleasure from that sweetness and that sweetness then increased the thoughts and gave them strength in your mind and so on and so forth. This touchless sort of falling into lust which is controlled up to a moment after which perhaps you've lost control and things became physical. 
or for many of us, was it the physical inability of your body to to go ahead, to move ahead without committing the sin? Or was it an emotion that took over you? Anything. Uh, the remembrance of someone whom you once loved, or the remembrance of someone's touch, and then you reimagined that touch. Or in some cases, it's not even an emotion that has to do with love, that has to do with any sort of loss, but an emotion that maybe pushes you into self-pity. This uh, crying over our own unhappiness, this feeling of being alone and belonging to no one, that eventually pushes you into a corner where all that feels familiar, all that feels a home to you, is the sin that you've known since you are perhaps a child. Things happen differently for every single one of us, but ultimately they are all consumed the same way. But the way they begin rarely, very rarely, actually has anything to do with our bodies. The way lust begins in most of us, in most cases for most of us, have to do with our thoughts, that is to say with our mind, or with our emotions, that is to say with our heart. These thoughts and emotions which we receive in ourselves, we give them the permission of our free will to enter us, and then we allow the um, bad sweetness, poisonous sweetness, to, to be poured in ourselves, to be injected, downloaded into ourselves, until we can no longer manage that poison. And then that poison takes hold over us, and we fall into sin with our bodies. And so we end up thinking that these are all bodily sins, and that this body is to be blamed and punished for everything, when in fact... For most of us, in most cases, the body is just the victim. The body is the abused, not the abuser. And to make things even worse, then we run screaming for help to the abusers themselves. We ask for help from our mind. We ask for help from our hearts. And we think, oh, my mind and my heart can pull me out of this nothingness, this wretched state of my body, when in fact the enemies, the gates for the real enemy, are the mind and the heart. And it is important, it is, I mean, it's not important, it is vital, it is essential to understand this, because otherwise... We are like guardians of a fortress. If you can imagine a fortress in the middle of the desert, and there are these enemies that come upon this fortress, and that fortress is ourselves, and there are several gates to our being. One gate is our body with its feelings, another gate is our mind with its thoughts, another gate is our heart with its emotions. And because we we've grown to believe that the weak gate, the gate that is always open for the enemy, the gate where the betrayal takes place, is always our bodies, we focus all our attention, all our um, army, all our defense abilities to protect the gate of the body. And the enemies enter our fortress through the other gates, through the mind and through the heart, through our thoughts and through our emotions, which are the real Judas of our being. Our thoughts, with whom we are so in love and we take such pride in our brain, in our mind and, and the thoughts that we are able to master. Our emotions, which we treasure so much, we actually identify ourselves with our emotions and how we feel about other people, how we feel about things and the world and so on and so forth. These are the Judas of our being. 
the thoughts that we worship and the emotions which we love. These are the big bad brothers that allow the younger, less experienced brother, the body, to fall into a passion, into a sin. And then we take, I don't know, we take a stick and we keep on kicking the little brother who, although he has fallen, is in fact innocent because he's only fallen because he's being pushed by the brain and the heart. We need to understand where the enemy comes in into our being in order for us to be able to direct all our attention and all our defense abilities and mechanisms to guard those gates, the gate of our mind and the gate of our heart, so we can keep watch not over every single movement of our body, but ev over every single thought of our mind and every single emotion that enters our heart. Once we've learned this basic lesson, once we've learned that the body, without the negative influence of the mind or the negative influence of the heart, the body in and of itself rarely and only <clears throat> at certain moments in our lives rarely generates sin itself. Once we've learned this, then we can start, then and only then, we can start to hope to develop a strategy to defeat this enemy of ours. And the surprise is, and this is what we'll talk about in our next video, God willing, the surprise is that... Um, <laughs> The very little brother whom we've uh, <clears throat> accused of all the faults and the suffering that we've experienced, this humble, small little brother is the one through whom we can learn to control the big brothers, the brother of the mind and the brother of the heart. It is through this little brother, through this little stove of the body, that we can do the work that will end up heating up the whole room of our being, including our minds and our hearts. It's not at all by accident that the fathers speak of our minds and our hearts as being either divine or evil demonic, because they can become anything, and they become what they allow to enter them. If we allow an evil demonic thought to enter us, or if we allow an evil demonic emotion to enter our heart, then we are going to end up with a demonic mind and a demonic heart. And of course, it's going to be reflected onto our bodies and the end results are going to be the sins of the body. But similarly, through the same gates of the mind and of the heart, divine thoughts and divine feelings can enter. And if we allow that divine sweetness to grow into us and to to grow roots and strength in our being, then the results of those divine thoughts and feelings are going to be, once again, seen bodily as well. We've just celebrated a few Sundays ago, the Sunday of St. Gregory Palamas, and his entire revelation and theology of divine light, experiencing the presence of God bodily, in our lives. But it all begins with this correct understanding of where the gates of the enemy into our being really are. And 90% of the time we are all guarding our body, the gate of the body. But in fact, for those 90% of the time, the enemy will enter our being through the mind and through the heart. 
I think either this week or next week or at some point in the future, we shall have to find a solution so that although we keep on traveling together by making these videos, I shall be able to record maybe just one video a week and maybe the second video will record something else, something that uh, doesn't involve me and uh, my face. I'm sick and tired of uh, looking at my face because somebody has to edit these videos as well, don't forget. And, um, and the truth is that at least in Britain, I know it's not the truth everywhere in the world, but at least in Great Britain, we are slowly, slowly, hopefully coming out of the pandemic. So increasingly, there is more work for me to do within the community and on the island. But we shall continue to travel together and at least once a week, I shall continue to record these videos. Not because you need them, but because we need you. That's the very humble, uh, you know, humble to the bone reality. We need you, and without your financial support, and without your prayers, God only knows if there would be a monastery in the Hebrides today. Be blessed, my brother and my sister. Be blessed wherever whoever, however you are in this world. Amen, amen, amen.